Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Zombo Land Gaming. I am Zombo Skater, and we are back with episode number four. I think this is four of Turing Complete. So uh, I've decided what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually do each one of the levels that I decide to put in each one of the video, and that way we'll just discuss how I came to that conclusion and how I built the circuit that I potentially built. Um, as we may have seen from other people's videos uh, or other help online and whatnot, not everyone's gonna come out with the same solution. Uh, some people will have a very messy big solution. Some people might have the smallest, most simplest solution. Um, doesn't mean they're right or wrong. Some may be cheaper in a real world application. Some may be more efficient and better in a real world application. But a lot of this stuff is not gonna quite be a real world application as we're gonna see in some of the things today. So we're gonna cover five of these today. Let's go ahead and get on in it. Um, so we have covered so far uh, all of the basic logic stuff and we made it to basically right here, this top three, uh, which are I think the uh, byte or, byte not, and byte uh, adding bytes. And then we got all the way up to uh, bit inverter on the uh, memory side of things. So today, we're going to cover uh, basically negative numbers, assigned negator, switches, input selecting, and then saving bytes. So we're going to try and cover as much information as we possibly can on each one of these. Uh, they were pretty simplistic. Oh, after I figured out what the hell they were trying to get me to do, the solutions were actually quite simple. I just do not like the way that they present information, especially with what we're going to get into today. So let's go ahead and get in on the first one. Negative numbers. Yes, I know I completed it. So to know the difference between things, you need subtraction. To get subtraction, first you need negative numbers. So we're actually going to go into one of my uh, other videos, uh, but we're just going to go into the slideshow, but we're not going to actually open up my video to discuss this. Before I even get on with this, we are actually going to go ahead and look at uh, but, 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 but right here. All right. So, so far, just like I discussed in these videos that I did, and then also where we've come to so far in, uh, in uh, Turing Complete, we haven't dealt with negative numbers. It's all been positive numbers, right? We've got a 1, a 2, a 4, an 8, a 16, a 32, a 64, and a 128, and some combination of those adds up to 255 or 0, right? So now we're going to start getting into negative numbers because you obviously want to be able to have a negative number displayed. There's two methods to do this so far that anybody has figured out really how efficiently to do. One is called signed magnitude, and that is what this first level is going to be about, is signed magnitude. Literally all this is trying to get us to do, and the as, as we'll see when I go through their description in the level, horrible horrible way to try and get you to come to this conclusion because the manner in which they're showing you the information is very uh, it, it puts you off on a on a witch hunt on a on a path that you don't need to be going down all it really is is you're either going to take the ones place or the 128th place what your, your least significant bit or your most significant bit one of the two generally it's going to be the most significant bit and all you do is assign it a zero or a one. If it's a zero, it means it's a positive decibel number. You can no longer use the 128 as a, a number for the rest of your, uh, your, your whatever, right? So it's gonna be 64 through one, which means you're only gonna get 127. If that bit 128 swaps to a one, then now you know you have a negative decibel number and literally all it does will be like, say on a seven segment display, You'll have the little negative symbol, right? That eighth bit, that 128 bit, will just tell your seven segment display, yeah, I'm a one, please turn on, and it'll turn that on. But then you've got 64 through one on the other seven bits that whatever numbers are assigned there, whatever number that equals, will still be the true binary that will then convert to the seven second display on the screen, right? It's horrible when it actually comes to doing addition and whatnot, so it's really not used much anymore. It's really basically just used for a negative 127 to 127 positive number or system for whatever whatever you're doing, right? So this is what's going to be the first level, and we're not going to pretty much use it after that. However, on the level after this, they kind of screw with your head pretty much because you're either going to use sign magnitude or you're going to use two's complement. You're not going to mix the two together most of the time. 
pretty much all of the time. You're either going to do two's complement or you're going to do sine magnitude, one or the other. So two's complement, which we're going to see in the next uh, next level, basically you take the binary number, you invert everything. So if it's a one, it's a zero. If it's a zero, it's a one, right? And then you add a one to it and then you're done. Much more simple, makes for addition easier. And I've got some examples here, right? So if a decimal number is positive, if the decimal number is positive, it is what it is. You don't have to do any extra steps or anything like that. You just take the decimal number and convert it to a true binary number. So like in the case here, I've got positive 41 in decimal and the, the 10 there just represents a base 10. So binary for 41 is we've got the six bit place, which is 32. The uh, four bit place, which is eight. So 32 plus eight makes 40. The ones place, which is a one. And so that makes 41. So the two's complement is going to be the exact same thing. It's 00101001. And it's 41 in binary. Now, however, if it's negative, you're going to take that decimal number. Don't worry about the negative symbol right now. Just ignore it. Just take whatever the decimal number is, convert it into binary, as we've already just seen. And then you're going to take all of that binary number and invert it. So any one becomes a zero and any zero becomes a one. That's technically called the ones complement. And so what they're going to be doing in this second level that we're going to see is they're doing a roundabout freaking weird way to get to the ones complement. And then the third step will be to add a one. So you're going to see in my second level here, there's going to be an on bit that's just on. And that's going to be our add one to get to our twos complement. So the number, you're always gonna have what would be considered our sign bit should always be a one if you've got a negative number. And we can actually show an example of this right here. So if you've got negative 41 in decimals, so here's our example again, we already know that true binary, we got 32 plus eight plus one makes 41. We've inverted everything. So you can see the zeros go to ones, the ones go to zeros the whole way down. I'm going to add a one and we've already used adders in the game. Uh, so this is actually something you should have learned before you even started dealing with adders, in my opinion. So all you're going to do is this zero at the end, you're going to add a one to it, which means, oh, one. And then one plus zero equals one. One plus zero equals one. Zero plus zero equals zero. One plus zero equals one. Blah, blah, blah. So this is your two's complement number. And this is what's going to come out on the other end, right? So that being said, I don't think I have anything we don't we don't need to worry about this this we can we can go move on to the game again hopefully that all made sense if not uh, i do have a series on actual digital theory outside of this game like real world digital theory um so go check that out i'm also starting a minecraft digital theory they're essentially going to be parallel series all three of these are going to be parallel series uh the minecraft one is obviously going to dismiss the real world stuff to make it work and fit inside Minecraft Redstone. I've got my digital theory, which is real world. And then we've got this game, which is kind of a mixture of what they're trying to get me to do in real world. So yeah. All right, so to know the difference between things, you need subtraction. To get subtraction first, you need negative numbers. We need a way to have negative values and bytes. The scheme we have been using so far can represent all numbers from zero to 255. That's what one plus two plus four plus eight plus 16 plus 32 plus 64 plus 128 equals. So we can go anywhere from number zero to 255. This scheme is called unsigned since it only deals with positive numbers. We need a sign in the unsigned, meaning the plus sign or a negative sign. That, that is the sign. That is it. Since it only deals with positive numbers. We need a scheme that allows negative numbers normally referred to as a signed representation. And uh, it's actually called sign magnitude representation. That's the real word for it. Additionally, it would greatly simplify future circuits if the representation works with the adder you've already made. And that's kind of hinting at two's complement coming down the line. All right, so they give a kind of an example here. So change what each bit means by changing the numbers. So they're trying to show us that we can come down here and we can actually uh, click on a number and we can actually come down in here and, and change a number, right? That, that, that's what they're trying to get us to do. Oop, turn that back off again. So what you see here is they've got bit number uh, the six here, the 32, and they're changing it to a negative four. And then when we go down, it says toggle the bits to see the results. So we can see that if we turn it on, now that bit becomes negative four, which is not how bits work. It would either be a one or it'd be a zero. It wouldn't be an actual decimal number. Um, so kind of some misrepresentation here, um, but they're trying to get you used to using a bit as a sign. 
because we could use the 32 if we wanted to, right? It would just mean that instead of 255, you would basically get negative one to, or actually, sorry, it would be negative one because you would be using it as literally a negative sign or no negative sign, but it would be, what's 255 minus 32? That's 123, right? Or 223. So you'd basically get negative 223 to positive 223. That's all that means. It just means that that 32, that sixth bit, you wouldn't be able to use that number. It would be 128 plus 64 plus 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. And then if that bit's turned on, you're going to get a negative sign. If it's turned off, it would just be the positive number. That's all that this is meaning. So it's kind of misrepresented. By one, they're using a bit that you would never use to assign. And two, you wouldn't have a negative decimal number. It's literally going to be, if it's on, negative symbol. If it's off, positive. So, okay, we'll do that. So let me put this back to how they had it originally. So obviously, this is our original. We got positive 128 all the way to one, right? So if we hit test, you can see that it says negative one's not represented. Well, okay, let me come down here to the negative one and let me just make this a negative. Test it again. Oh, now it says negative two's not represented. Well, shit, all right, okay. So let me clear that back up and let me make a negative two. And you're gonna see that it says negative three's not represented. Well, shit, okay, so let's not do that. Let's come all the way over here to negative 128. And we can see that the next step down, it says, I want to represent 127 to negative 127. Well, I'm going to change this to negative 127, right? Because that's the values I'm wanting, negative 127. Okay, let me test that. Well, hey, cool. I've got two of them okay now because I'm representing. If I turn this on, you can see I've got negative 127. If I turn it off and turn all, all of them on, I should say, you can see I got zero, and if I turn the negative 127 off, I've got positive 127. Cool. Zero to 127 still works, because 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1, a 7-bit system, will give you 127 numbers. Okay, but wait a minute, we got more red. You have two ways to represent zero, which leads to zero plus one equaling zero. So we can see if I turn them all on, sure enough, I get zero. And if I turn them all off, but negative one... Or, or sorry, the positive one, then okay, zero plus one, if I was to have an adder that way, oh God, that's gonna equal zero, shit. So I can't do that, right? Okay, so all they're wanting me to do is they're wanting me to display that we're gonna get 128 to 128, which isn't, which isn't feasible. So here we go. Now if we test it, we've got negative 128, we can test it, there we go. So that's all they were wanting you to do was to change that sign magnitude portion, which like I said, in real world scenarios would just be on or off, negative, positive, not an actual value whatsoever. You would only literally get the value of the rest of the bits being added together. So little real world theory versus the game. The game literally just wanted you to put 128. So that way, when you put it into an adder, 120, a negative 128 plus one gets you negative 127. All right, let's move on. Okay, so the next one is uh, we're going to go ahead and finish this part of the arithmetic up. Signed negator. So here's where they're going to once again misrepresent stuff by using both sign magnitude and two's complement. And as we've already seen, we've worked out how two's complement works. So hopefully we won't have to have much discussion on this. Taking the input assigned where the eighth bit is negative 128. So they're actually inputting a decimal negative 128, not a positive or negative sign. Make a component that takes a number and negates it. For example, four negated would be negative four. Negative nine negated would be become nine. We already kind of have an idea of how this works, right? If I, since we know that they're taking actual decimal numbers instead of just taking a one or a zero, we know that a not bit, a not will take it from being on and turn it off and we'll take it off and turning on. That suits here, right? Negative four is the opposite of positive four. So if I have a negative four in and I have a not bit, well, I'm gonna get positive four out. If I have positive four coming in and I not it, I invert it, then I'm gonna get a negative four coming out. So that, that bit of information is already there. So what I have basically going on here is we know we have a byte and we can actually step through, right? Any of these tests, you can step through and screw with the game to kind of try and figure out what they're trying to do. Cause like right now we don't see any inputs on or off, right? I mean, I could come up here and turn inputs on or off if I wanted to, but I can just go next tick and see that they're wanting 
negative one times 123, which is also kind of misleading because you're not multiplying anything. I mean, a computer doesn't do multiplication. It does a whole bunch of addition and subtraction to get your multiplication, but that's a whole nother step that we're going to get to later on in the game. Uh, but, but really, really, this is uh, misrepresenting how it should be. And as you can see, 123 here because of this negative 128 they're doing it in decimal not in actual binary value which frustrates the hell out of me it makes my brain go why why not just use ones and zeros and, and just let the person add this stuff up himself so we already know how adders work so what what this basically wanted you to do is to take the input and we already have these byte bits here you know a byte maker and a byte splitter so we're basically taking the bit or the byte and splitting it up so we can actually see each individual bit value. And I'm just nodding every one of them. And if you come up here to the top, I don't think we've discussed this before. There's this little button up here that I can either go to just regular positive numbers or I can tell it I want you to be the sign magnitude. And then it will automatically assign the eighth bit is that negative 128. Once again, not ones or zeros. They're actually putting a decimal 128 in there. So kind of kind of ridiculous. But anyway, so that right there, you have to make sure that's one of the things. I don't think they, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, taking the input assigned. So they didn't tell you about it, but I believe if we come to our manual, um, yeah, negative numbers, uh, they don't even tell you about it here. They, yeah, they don't even tell you about it here. So you have to come up here. That's another thing that I didn't realize because they don't explain it anywhere. They don't tell you about it anywhere. You have to toggle that to make it a signed number. So there we go. So we're, we're sitting as our input now is a signed number. I've nodded everything. So what's coming out is the opposite. And uh, I think if we zoom in here, you can see that here we've got 128 to 123 coming in. And I've just inverted everything. So the positive right here, or sorry, the one that's off is now on. Anything that's on is off, vice versa, right? So what this is doing, as we explained in our uh, twos complement study there, this is basically doing the ones complement for us, right? Nodding everything gets us from the true binary to the ones complement. So this is the ones complement. And then the next step to get us to the, um, to get us to the twos complement, which is gonna give us our actual uh, you know, negative number out, is to add one. So that's all we're doing, taking the ones complement right here, adding one, because if we look at our on bits here, all that is is, oh, oops, oops, actually I can just click on this one, can I? It just says always on, right? There you go. So always on, going into an adder, we're not worrying about carrying out or carrying in, because all we're doing is taking the permanently on thing, adding it to the ones complement, getting the number out. So if I step through, you can see, Negative one times 88 equals negative 88. Because we're getting our ones complement, which is basically going to be one off of the number that we want. So you can see negative 89 plus a positive one gets you negative 88. Step all the way through that. Bam, there you go. So that's all they wanted you to do there. All right, now moving on. Uh, obviously, I can't go up into uh, the CPU architecture yet because it requires this portion over here, which requires memory to be open. So we're going to go on to switches. So switches, um, I don't know if we've really seen this before, but this kind of gives you a clue. Create a component that switches an input byte. Once again, we're not working with individual bits. We're working with a whole byte, which is eight bits on or off. If you get stuck, try this hint. Hmm, what is the hint? What would this look like if you were only switching one bit? What would the truth table for such a component look like? Well, we can already see what I have here, but let's go up to gates, right? And if we look at all our gates, a not gate is either on or off, the opposite. An and gate, hey, look, we only get one value out, right? Both of them have to be on in order to get an output. If we go to uh, the bigger and, we already know what that is. A NAND is the exact opposite. If both are on, it's off. It's the only time it's off. An OR gate is if anything's on, it's on. A NOR gate is if both of them are off, it's on. If anything's on, then it's off. And the exclusive OR is one or the other has to be on for it to be on. And the exclusive NOR is you both have to be off or you both have to be on for it to be on. So once again, we come up here, right? It says 
create a component that switches an input byte on or off. So all we're doing here is this is called an enable line. This is once again, something that I would have taught pretty much before I even really discussed much with logic gates. Um, I would have I would have discussed, well, maybe right after I explained the basic logic gates, explaining simple uses of single logic gates, because right here is kind of combinational logic, because we're using a whole bunch of different logic gates to get something out, and that's combining logic gates, that's combinational logic. So not too many components nowadays use an individual just by itself logic gate. They usually have a bunch together, hence combinational. Um, but an enable line, uh, you know, for enabling a saving or a loading or a reading or a writing or a turning your program counter on, turning the input to your memory on, so on and so forth, that is called an enable line. And that's all this is doing here is they want you to switch or enable this on or off. And the hint that they gave you there where it says, uh, what would this look like if you were only switching one bit? That's what we're doing, anding, right? Because the only time we can get one bit out is if we have both inputs onto an AND gate. So we're enabling every one of these AND gates. It's the same exact signal. So this enable bit turns on, it goes to one side of all these AND gates, and then depending on which bit is on here, will depend on whether we get that bit out or not. So here we go. So if we step through, you can see, oh God, I just choked. Oh God, I might need some water. I'm yakking too much. So you can see we've got 216 in binary. Oh, hold on. Uh, do I need to toggle? Okay, I, I, I can leave. It doesn't really matter, right? So, so we've got. Uh, let, me, let me let me reset this. There we go. So we've got our 216 in binary. I had our. I still had our sign number on. We got our 216 in binary coming through. This enable line is going to every single one of these AND gates. So the only AND gates that are going to output are the bits that are actually on. We step to the next one. It wants zero because the input line is off. So nothing's enabled. Even though there's 166 coming over here, nothing's enabled. So we get nothing out, which is exactly what they wanted. 202, same thing, same thing over and over again, right? That's all it is. It's called an enable line going into an AND gate. So it takes both the enable and the input going in to turn it on. Yay. And now they gave us a switch. So, you know, switches to help enable us. Now we're going to go to input selector. Even though he did not pass our test, we were decided we decided to keep the dog. Unlike most earthlings, he is fluffy and follows simple instructions well. We might want to team you two up since you're comp since you complement each other's shortcomings well. I like doggos. Doggos are nice. When the bit selector input is off, output byte A, otherwise output byte B. So we've seen this before. Uh, when we were using the exclusive or to turn on and off different things, uh, when we went with the uh, the the SR nor latch the uh, the latch system, we used an exclusive or. And actually, let me go ahead and go back to that. Um, where was that at? Uh, saving gracefully, I believe. Close. Uh, nope, that wasn't it. Um, did we have an example of this yet? I don't know if we have. I don't know if we did. Um, so basically, if we look at this here, we, we know a not gate, right? A not gate is on when it's off, it's off when it's on. So since we only have one input here, as we can kind of see peeking in the background here, we only have one input, and we either have to select this one, or we have to select that one. So all we're going to do is we're going to take that input, and we're going to have a regular line, and then a knotted line. So that way, when the input is off, the knotted line will be on. So it's either going to be one or the other. And then now that they gave us a switch, instead of having to use an AND gate, I could still use an AND gate if I wanted to, uh, but all I need to do is these switches. So if I click on a switch here, you can see that the top of the switch is the enable line. So one input of an AND gate, and then the input line is just coming to the left and then outputs right. So all I'm doing here, unfortunately they don't give us a byte OR, so we can't use an OR gate right here at the output to have either OR of the outputs. So we have to ignore that for the time being and just go straight in. But all I'm doing is taking this input. Like if I turn this input on, you can see this switch won't be turned on because I don't have any power coming here. If I turn it back off, this one is now turned on. This one is off. That's all I'm doing. I'm selecting either A or B, depending on if the input is on or off. So if we step through, you can see they want 20 out. 
The bottom one is apparently uh, B. So this is B, this is A. A is the top, B is the bottom. Let me explain that a little better. So I've got my input on, which means this switch is turned on, letting the 20 go through. Step to the next one. I want 63, which is input A. So the input line, the enable line is turned off, which actually inverts and turns this switch on. So on, so forth. Pretty, pretty simple circuit. Enables are used quite often, especially in your control logic and whatnot for your computer. And that's what's telling you what to actually enable down the line. Like, is this bus going to be open to allowing your adders, your, uh, your, um, your uh, ALU to output? Uh, is it going to allow inputs to your, your SRAM to grab your addressing for either the program counter or information that you then want to send to a register or any of those sort of things, which we'll see later on. Enable lines are very important. But that's really all that was. It's just now we have the switch instead of an AND gate. We could actually, uh, we could uh, new circuit real fast and we could just take this away. I was actually trying to do this with, uh, with nor latches, but if we take um, gates and just go, oh, that is a bigger AND gate. I don't want that. Gates and AND gate. Give me this AND gate. Thank you. And if we just did this, same thing, right? And I don't believe this is going to work because these aren't byte AND gates, but the, I'll just show you the schematic. Imagine these are byte AND gates. Like, I would have to, like, literally put the byte splitter, put an AND gate at everything, and then a byte maker out. Um, but you would just basically have something like this, right? Oop, uh, alt, yoink, and then yoink, and then take this. Uh, I'm dragging stuff everywhere. Bam. And then, bam, oh, I'm trying to make this so we can actually see where these are all going, like that. And then we would just have these go like this. But of course, this isn't going to work because it's going to output a one instead of the actual byte signal, as we can see. Watch. See? <laughs> Your answer is number one. Well, of course it is. And actually, that's really funny. That's really funny. Uh, I forgot to put my knock gate in here. Gates, not. Uh, space bar rotates. Bam. There we go. Can I do this now? There we go. Now, now you can see it would work if it was a byte AND gate, which I'm assuming they're probably going to give us later, seeing as how they gave us a switch, a byte and, uh, and adder, and then we have our regular adder as well. So I don't know why they're giving us little things here and there. But that's the similar thing, right? We already saw that that is a switch, but they gave us an actual byte switch. All right, moving on to the last one for today. So saving bytes. So now we've already seen an SR NOR latch before. Now they're giving us a byte SR NOR latch, which there's logic IC chips for this, but they're literally eight inputs going in. It's not one individual input going in. It's eight inputs going in. So this is once again, something that's not how real world works, <laughs> but similar. Uh, they haven't even explained flip flops yet which is a whole nother thing. D flip-flops are generally used. JK flip-flops are generally used, and we'll probably talk about those later, but we wouldn't be using SR NOR latches for the most part in circuits, but they're getting there. Once again, they use the things that I don't like, save and load. It should be read and write. Create a circuit that can save or load a byte. When the first input is on, load the memory and send it to the output. When the second input is on, save the input byte. So you're going to see my, my mess going on over here. Uh, they gave us an input that just has two, you know, an A and a B input coming off of it, which is something they really haven't shown us yet, and they don't have any information really for it. Uh, we can turn these on so we can see that input one is on the top and input two is on the bottom. Okay, good. That's good information, right? And we already know that the switch, um, please, can I see the switch here? Hello, hello. I'd like to see the switch. There we go. So once again, we know that the enable is on the top and this is on the bottom. We already know that an SR NOR latch, hello, I'd like to see this, please, is, it says save enable on the top of it, save value is on the bottom. So the value is going to be what's going into it, and then the enable is on the top. So all we're going to do here is, based on their information, what they say is they want to, when the second input is turned on, which we've already seen is the bottom, that is our save, right? So all we're going to do is we're going to take each one of these bits to the save value side of each individual bits SR NOR latch. And then we're going to take this enable, which we know is called being called the save line and take it to the save enable. So now the next step of this is when the first input bit is turned on, which is this one, we want to load that output. So what's going to happen here 
and it's something that they don't explain, is that when you save a bit, that information's not coming out here yet. It's inside the SR NOR latch, but it's not being sent out yet until the switch allows the circuit to complete, and then that output value will go out. When that happens, our input may be turned on with another bit of information coming here, but it hasn't switched yet, so it won't be exporting that new data out. And so this circuit makes good sense once you, uh, once you see it in action. So here we go. We've got A is our load line. So this is telling it, yes, you can send that information out, or no, you can't send that information out. And this right here is saying, I want to save whatever information you're giving to me. So let's step it through. So it says it wants us to save 17. So you can see I've got 17 coming here on this input line, and we have the 16 and the one bits on, and you can see my one and 16 are turned on on my SR NOR latches. Cool, we've saved a bit. Step it on, now it's saying load the bit. So now you can see that I have 244 coming in here on this value, and the, yes, it is coming down here, but because my save enable's not turned on, it's not actually saving that value. So they're not really showing the representation of the set reset pins on an SR NOR latch. And actually, in my opinion, I think that they're probably using a D flip flop or a JK flip flop inside here, but they haven't talked to you about that yet. Uh, so you can see that we've got this value coming here, but because the enable's not on, that information is not going there. So the only information that's coming out is that 17 because we have our load line enabled. And then when we come to the next thing, you can see now, hey, we've changed the 33, but neither my load enable or my save enable are turned on. So we still have this 17 stored here, but we're not allowing it to come out because we turned our switch off. And then it just steps through and does the same thing. We're gonna save 179, and you can see that we've saved 179 in here, but we're still exporting that 17 out. We're still we haven't loaded the new information in yet. It's still the same old information. But once again, we don't have our load line turned on, so nothing's happening. Now we're going to save 189, and you can see that 179 now gets pushed out. But we're not loading it, so it's not going anywhere. But the 179 is here. However, we are saving 189 now. And now we've exported 189 because we're loading it, and we're not doing anything with this 41, so on and so forth. So hopefully that made a little bit of sense. Uh, you know, Once again, we've seen what SR NOR latches do. We can see that they're telling us that the top is a save enable. It wants us to enable and it wants us to load. And that's all we're doing here. We're loading with a enable switch and then we're using SR NOR latches to save that information. So hopefully that was a, a good enough explanation for you guys. If you want me to go a little bit more in detail on the actual real world scenario, I will be posting more videos in the future of the actual real world digital theory. Uh, please go watch that series. Or if you want to see uh, another use of real world logic, I also have my Mindstone Redstone, uh, stu my Minecraft Redstone circuitry that I'll be doing as well. I've only got one episode of that up right now, and it's pretty much word for word the exact same thing as the Digital Theory one, just cool colored blocks with shaders. <laughs> so anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, next week, we are going to complete these last five right here uh, in the arithmetic and memory. And then we'll be moving on into getting up towards an actual working computer, <laughs> actual CPU architecture. So like, subscribe, comment, share, all that silly stuff that everybody has to mention. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. And I will see you guys in the next episode. Uh, probably Satisfactory, followed by Minecraft. Satisfactory will be on Wednesday. Minecraft will be on Friday. And then we may have a music theory thing because I've come up with uh, another little lesson thing that i did and then we will have a digital theory uh class as well and then followed by this so see you guys next week ta-ta bye bye